Man, I'm excited. My friend Greg, I was talking to him on the phone the other day. He was telling me that he's going from us to do, I think it's the Colts uh, chapel service, and then he's headed off to Israel uh, with, with Bishop Stearns and Eagle's Wings. And so I'm um, just grateful that we get to have him be a part of what's going on here at The Rock, it was, as well as Marcus Witt. Uh, both of them just awesome men of God, and both of them travel the world preaching the gospel. And so, men, you're going to enjoy that time. So make sure to sign up today at the tent right outside after church service. You'll see that tent out there or get the QR code and go online and sign up, make sure to sign up early, all right, because we want to know that you're coming and we've got some great things planned and in store for you. Well, hey, Rock family, it's good to be with you guys. Love you guys. Anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Yeah. We're going to have a great time in the Word today. Today, we've got a message from God that I, I believe is, is one of those messages that, that interests people. A lot, a lot's been said on it. Uh, a lot of books have been written, a lot of podcasts, all that kind of stuff. Uh, people have taught. And, and there's been a lot of good teaching as well as a lot of bad teaching on it, all right? And so today, we're just going to simply look at what Jesus has to say about this subject. And I want to make sure that you get everything you can out of the message. So I want you to lean in to the Word of God today. Make sure to put your cell phones on do not disturb mode. Uh, you know, if you're using them for your Bible, that's cool. Maybe you're taking notes on them. That's great. Just make sure you're not getting notifications and things like that. Uh, and, and so you can put them on silent mode as well. Don't get up and walk around during the message. God wants to speak to you. I'm the one that's talking and who needs a drink of water. Okay, so you don't need a drink of water. You can, you can hold on. You know, I know you watch those movies that are like three and four hours long. You got your legs crossed. You're doing the dance and all that kind of stuff, but you want to see all the action. And yet God's speaking to you about your life and, and about things that pertain to the future. And you're going, oh my gosh, I got to go use the bathroom. And you run out on what God's saying to you. So make sure to focus in on what God has to say. And then for all the parents in the fan rooms, hey, love you guys on this side. Wave at me over here in the fan rooms. Love you guys. All right. On this side, wave at me over here in the fan rooms. Love you guys. Packed. But uh, you know what's amazing? First service, there was nobody in either of the family rooms. Now they're both filled to the hilt. So I guess, uh, you know, if you split them in half, everybody came to the second service today. So you're going to be glad that you did. God has some great things in store for us. And so make sure to make that about a two-week experience there in the family rooms and get your children over to the greatest children's ministry on the planet. They're going to love it. And you're going to be able to come and get the Word of God at your level over here as well. So let's get into the Word. Get your Bible in hand. Come on. Even online. Come on. Get, let's get ready for the Word of the Lord. Would you join us? If you, if you have the ability, would you stand to your feet? Let's honor the Lord. I'm going to get down on my knees. And let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak to our hearts today. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we're so grateful, God, that today that we can be in your house lifting up our hearts and our hands, lifting our voices in song lifting you up, God, and exalting you in our praise. And God, we're so grateful for your presence, God. Without it, God, it, it, it's not going to work, Lord. And so we desire you above all else. We thank you today, God, that we have not come to hear from the ideas and the philosophies of man. But God, we've come to hear from you. We welcome your Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church. Holy Spirit, part of your job description is to show us things to come. So give us a picture of the future, God. As we look into what Jesus had to say about these things, God, we're grateful that you're going to illuminate our hearts to have a good understanding, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand, so that we can be good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Today, Lord, we don't just ask these blessings on ourselves only. God, as you open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to understand, God, as, as we can hear by the Spirit of God and become all that you've called us to be and do all that you've called us to do. But God, also we pray for our brothers and sisters, all the churches here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapels, Assembly of God, Foursquare, Evangelical Free, Victory Outreach, God, the, the uh, Catholic churches and Adventist churches, Messianic Jewish congregations, that met yesterday, Lord, if they're lifting up your name, preaching your gospel truth, God, we bless them just as you bless us, God. And we thank you, Father God, that your spirit is moving in the midst of your church, God, strengthening and building it, strong and healthy, prevailing and overcoming, God. We pray for the persecuted church to overcome, God. May they endure to the end to the glory of God, strengthen their hand, God. And we thank you, Father God, that you're watching over them as well. Lord, we do pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for peace in our land. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we're all in agreement and we say... Amen, amen. Today, as you're having a seat, get your Bibles and go with me to Mark, the 13th chapter. We're in a series called the Body Life Series, talking about the life of Jesus Christ when he's here on the earth. And we're going story by story throughout the life of Jesus Christ, seeing how we're to live life, because we presently today are the body of Christ. 
And today, the story portion of what we're going to take a look at is very short. Now, normally, I've been taking these sections of scriptures and where Jesus had lengthy teaching and that sort of thing. We've gone on to take a look at the next story and just been kind of skipping through the life of Jesus, looking at what he did so we can see what we're to do in life. And yet, I thought it was important that we take a look at this section of Scripture in this portion because Jesus does something prophetically, and then at length, he discusses it with the disciples. And it's a, a subject that all of us, I believe, at some point or another, have either thought about or been interested in, or maybe you've heard teaching on it, and may, maybe it even scared you. But today, the title of the specific message and what we're talking about is Preparing for the End Times. Preparing for the end times. Mark chapter 13, starting in verse number one, it says this, and he went out of the temple. Stop right there. That's the whole story portion right there for you. Jesus walked out of the temple. See, Jesus at this time is the presence of God manifested in the flesh. This is the Son of God, and he's God in the flesh representing God to man and man to God. And prophetically, Jesus leaves the temple. He walks out of the temple. And in doing so, we know that the last time that this happened, that the presence of God left the temple, that the destruction was certain and coming soon. And so Jesus, this is the last time you see him as he exits the temple there. He was teaching that week in the temple courts. He was there by the temple treasury, looking at the widow, giving her two copper coins, right? And we remember those things. And yet now Jesus does something. He leaves. And in leaving, he's speaking and he's saying something. He's showing something. But it says, as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. Now, I, I would imagine that this disciple that came to Jesus and spoke these things to him was probably a lot like me. I love a good landscape. I love architecture. I love photography. I, I mean, I, I get lost. My, my family, oftentimes, they wail and they moan when I pick up my camera as we're going on vacation because they're like, seriously? Like, are we going to be waiting around for you to get the perfect vista, the perfect sunset, that sort of a thing? And I'm like, listen, I will leave it to just 6,772 photos this time around, okay? Not the normal 10,000 that I normally do. It'll be all right, you know, but, but I love that. And so, you know, there's moments where I, I get caught up. Sometimes when I'm driving, my wife's like, eyes on the road, honey, you know, because it's just like, I'm just like, wow, look at that. And so I would imagine the disciple just had one of those hearts that loves a good view. In fact, we just dropped our daughter off at, at college the other day, and she sent me a picture out of her dorm room window. Dad, God gave me your anointing. I've got the, the view. And there was a sunset view out of her dorm. I'm like, hello, come on, somebody. Praise the Lord for that sunset. You know, I was so grateful. But, but here's the disciple, and he's looking at the temple just in awe, and he wanted to share it with Jesus. I, I mean, the best things in life are shared with God, aren't they? And so he runs to Jesus, and he says, hey, look at, look at the temple. Well, look at the manner of stones and what buildings are here. Verse 2, and Jesus answered and said to him, do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone will be left on another that shall not be thrown down. Probably shook that disciple to the core. Wait a second, hold on. The, the, the great temple? All of the colonnade, the buildings, the treasury, the, the different buildings on the sides. I, I mean, wait, what, what, what's going on? He might have ran to another one of the disciples. Did you hear what Jesus said? All this is going to be gone. And it's going to be leveled. One of the other disciples, did, did I hear what I think I just heard? And there might have been a little bit of a rumble going on. Look at the next verse, verse number three. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, verse four, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Verse number five, and Jesus answering them began to say, take heed that no one deceives you. Now, in the rest of this chapter, and you can also go in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 24, and the Gospel of Luke, I believe it's Matthew, uh, Luke, chapter number 21, I believe, somewhere about it's there, that you can find these same verses and these same thoughts, a little bit of variation between the different Gospel writers, but very similar, very similar. And, uh, and, and the amazing thing to me is that the disciples, they ask two questions here. First, they ask, when will this happen? And secondly, they ask, what will be the sign for us to know that it's going to happen? And Jesus proceeds to tell them about the future and starts to talk to them even about the end of the age. And so in Matthew, the question's a little bit different. They say, tell us when will these things be? But then it changes a little bit in the second question. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now that explains why Jesus goes into what we would consider to be the end times is because they're asking about not only the destruction of the temple, but when Jesus returns. See, in their minds, the Messiah was going to come and set up his kingdom. 
And so they're saying, okay, hold on. If the temple's going to be destroyed, then obviously you're going to set up your kingdom on the earth because you're going to overthrow Rome and you're going to take over the whole world. So therefore, if the temple's destroyed, that, that's a bad thing. That would have to be Rome. So you're going to be coming and you're going to be destroying them and wiping them out. So in their minds, this thing is connected. The messianic kingdom is going to come on the earth. But Jesus separates these two things. Even though he tells them about what's going to happen with the destruction of the temple, he goes on to tell them the second question. He answers their question about the end of the age. They just didn't realize that the age would last for a millennium. You understand? It's been 2,000 years. And we've been waiting because there's been a dispensation that we're in the midst of. What is that? It's a, it's a season of time. It's a span or a length of time in which there's a certain activity going on. And in this dispensation, we're in the dispensation of grace, and we're in the time of the Gentiles, as the Gentiles are being allowed to come into the church. In other words, it, it used to be about Israel. They were the chosen people of God. They had the covenants. They had the promises. But then there came a time where Jesus went to the cross, and now Jesus takes both Jews and Gentiles alike, and he opens the door for everybody to come in, and that's the season that we're in right now, is that it's not exclusive to Israel. And there's a, a jealousy that's forming on the inside of Israel. If you read in the book of Romans, you'll find out about this, that they're going, well, hey, wait a second. We're the chosen people. We're the special ones. And, and we say, well, hey, you know what? God's opened the door for everybody. We're a part of the covenants too. And the Bible says that there's going to come a time where that season will wrap up and Israel will come back in in its fullness. And we're going to see salvation of the Jews. We're going to see some amazing things that take place on the earth. But right now we're in this dispensation waiting for the return of the Lord. And so Jesus opens these things up to them. Now, I want you to notice in verse number five that Jesus warns of deception when it comes to the end times. See, uh, we, we've all heard of people that have erroneously taught about the end times that Jesus is coming back on this day and this hour and this moment, or some people saying, I'm Jesus, right? And we, we've heard all of this bad teaching on the end times. In fact, there are religions, world religions, we would call them cults because they're false religions that come along and they say, well, you know, Jesus already came back. He didn't like what he saw, so he went back up into heaven. I, I don't think God is that confused. I, I don't know about you, but I think God knows what's going on on the earth, don't you? I, I mean, it's amazing to me that someone would be so foolish to follow something like that, that Jesus didn't know what was going on. He had to come to earth by himself, invisible, walk around, look at everything. Oh, I really don't like what's going on here. Back up to the Father until they figure this thing out and get it right. That, that's not what happened. That's, that's erroneous teaching, and that's not what the Bible has to say. Today we're going to examine what Jesus has to say because Jesus wanted his disciples to be prepared for what was coming, and he wants us to be prepared as well. Are you listening today? So how do we prepare for the end times? If you'll apply yourself to understand the things that we're going to cover today, and we're going to cover some topics, some things that might be a little bit difficult to understand, some things that might excite you, some things that might fright you. There, there might be some things that, that, that you go, is that real? Is that, I mean, what, what is that going to be like? Now, listen, we can't get into all of it, all right? And I would encourage you, if this interests you, to, to find some solid resources, and we'll, we'll talk about those at the end of the message, but as well, to press into the Spirit of God and to apply yourself in the Word of God and stick to what the Bible has to say say and and go with that more than you do anything else and if you need some help your church is here and definitely sign up for bible college the next time it comes around because we have an eschatology course that studies the end times at length and you can dive in deep and get your questions answered there as well but today i just want to cover the statements of jesus here in mark chapter 13 to find out how do we prepare for the end times let's read on let's read on mark chapter 13 this time verse number six and down through verse number 10 mark chapter 13 Verse number six says this, For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. Now, we know this has already taken place, right? There are many people who have come and they've said, I'm Jesus Christ. In fact, I've met some of them out in our parking lot after church. Maybe you might have met them at the gas station afterwards after we kicked them off of the church property. But there are many people who come, and the Bible says they will actually deceive many. You've heard of some of these people. Maybe they never said that they were Jesus Christ. And they might have not said that they were the Messiah, but they came claiming to be somebody. People, probably you'll recognize these names. People like Jim Jones. People like David Koresh. Okay, we understand what their end was. We, we know uh, there was that whole group of people that they all died wearing their Nikes, and they were all waiting for aliens to land on the earth, Right? You guys remember that? Some of you guys are shaking your head. Some of you guys are staring at me like a cow at a new gate. See, there are things that take place where there's 
massive deception that goes on. And Jesus said, be aware that if people come claiming to be Christ or claiming to be something, that, that you're not deceived, that you don't buy into the lie, but you keep your heart strong in the Lord. It goes on in verse number seven, he says, but when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. There have been many times all over the earth where wars have broken out. In fact, during World War II, they thought for sure that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist and that the world was going to end. Now, we understand that Adolf Hitler was a Antichrist. Hello. It, just like uh, 1 John says that there are many Antichrists who have come into the world and already are at work in the world. And the spirit of the Antichrist is working in the world. But just because there's a war doesn't mean that it's the end of the world just yet. Because these things must happen. In fact, it's been estimated that throughout the world's history that for every 13 years that there's only been one year that has been without war in all of our history. Is that crazy? Wars are going on all over the world that we don't even know about. It goes on in the next verse. It says this, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places like Southern California at times. And there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. You know, I think that we've had a false positive in recent years because of social media, because these things have been going on all throughout history. There have been tsunamis, there's been earthquakes, there's been troubles, there's been things that have been going on, and yet in recent years, because of the knowledge increasing and because of communication increase, all of a sudden people said, well, it's sped up. Things are happening more rapidly. Well, I don't know that they really are. I think we're just understanding and we're able to see things more accessibly than ever before, and all of a sudden people are freaking out and going, ah, it's the end. Well, yeah, I get it. I understand, and I would also agree, but I also think there's some things that need to happen before we get to the end. The Bible is clear about certain things, things like the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist being revealed. He's being restrained right now until the time comes for him to be revealed. Also, Jesus talks about the abomination that causes desecration in the temple, standing in the place where he should not be, proclaiming himself to be God with lying signs and wonders, deceiving many people. Don't, don't get it twisted. If somebody shows up and starts doing miracles, you need to test the spirits to see whether or not it's God. Because even Satan has a supernatural power that he can exert on the earth, and the Antichrist will do miracle signs and wonders that would deceive even the elect if possible. Hmm. So we need to understand what Jesus is saying because these false positives could make us think that it's the end, and yet he says it's the beginning of sorrows. That, that could be translated literally the beginning of the birth pangs. Some of the ladies know what we're talking about when we talk about birth pangs, right? They start with just a little discomfort. Mm, I don't like that. Ooh. How did they teach me to breathe in the maz? Then what happens? Oh, wow, that was a big one. That was a big one. But I think I got this. I'm going to go no epidural. What happens five minutes later? Oh, give me the epidural, honey. Take me to the hospital now. Why didn't you pack the bag beforehand? Why? Because all of a sudden the, the pains are starting and they get more frequent and more intense with each one. Is that right? See, I, I believe that's what we're going to experience on the earth as the end times get closer and closer. It's going to be more frequent and more intense. Are you listening? Now, we never have to fear these things because God is with us through all these things and his grace will keep us. And in fact, the Bible says that we are not appointed to wrath. When the wrath of God is being poured out on the earth, the church will not be here. I do know that for a fact. You say, well, pastor, are you, okay, so pastor, hold on. Are you saying pre-trip? Is that what you're saying? No tribulation, no tribulation. All we don't have to go through is just beam me up, Jesus, and we're out of here. No, that's not what I said. That is not what I said, because we're not appointed to wrath, but the Bible does says we will experience tribulation on the earth. So we're going to go through some things, and we're going to be here for, through some things. But there will become a point where God takes his church out, and the wrath of God is poured out. And we're not appointed to that wrath. But it says that these are the beginnings of the birth pangs. You're going to see these things happening more frequent and more intense. Verse number 9, but watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils. And you will be beaten in the synagogues. 
You'll be brought before rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony to them. Uh, now, this was actually fulfilled in the life of the disciples, wasn't it? They were actually brought before the Sanhedrin. They were beaten. They were put in prison. They were told not to preach in the name of God again. You can read about this in the book of Acts, early on in the book of Acts, Acts chapter number three. Man gets healed, and all of a sudden, they're in jail. Happened right away. And they brought them back again and again. They beat him up. The apostle Paul, you can see this all throughout his lifetime all throughout the history of the church. So there was an immediate application as well as an unfolding revelation as it went on into the church, as most prophecy is. That there will be a natural physical application, but also an unrolling, continuing revelation that unfolds throughout time. And so this was not just for the disciples only, this is for the church, because we know that there are people today that are being imprisoned for their faith. Today, that are being beaten up for their faith. See, Jesus is saying the life of a disciple will experience tribulation and trials, and people will come against you for the preaching of the gospel. Jesus said if they did it to the master, they'll do it to the student. It's going to happen to you. Verse number 10, look at this. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. If we're going to be prepared for the end times, how do we prepare for the end times? First thing that Jesus just mentioned, notice this, is that the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. That means we have to preach to the end. We have to preach to the very end. Don't let up. Don't give up. Don't shut up. If they beat you up, then get up. You keep preaching up. You keep going for it. You don't shut your mouth. You don't let off. You keep going and keep preaching because this gospel must be preached to all the nations. I heard the story of two guys on the side of a road with road signs in their hands. They had these big signs, and every car that would pass by, they would wave them at the cars. One of the guy's signs said, turn or burn. The other guy's sign said, the end is near. And so as they're out there, a car passes them by, and they shook the signs, and they yelled, hey, read the signs. And the guy looked at the signs and read them as he drove by, and he shook his fist at him, and he says, leave me alone, you religious nuts. A moment later, he turned around the bend, and they heard a loud crash. And the one guy looked at the other, and he said, do you think that we should have wrote on our signs the bridge is out due to the wildfire. (laughs) See, we need to not let up in our preaching. We need to make sure that we have a clear message that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And because we know that the end is coming, there will come a day when we wrap these things up that we need to be ready for Jesus' return, and therefore we need to preach the word of God. I want you to hold your finger there in Mark chapter number 13, or maybe you want to put a pencil, or if you have a ribbon in your Bible, or maybe you want to put a foot or your neighbor's arm or something, whatever you have, just put it there in Mark chapter 13, and turn with me over to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Turn there with me, 2 Timothy chapter number 4, and it's okay that you didn't laugh at my second joke. That's all right. I'll, I'll forgive you, and we'll just move on. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to be, in fact, bouncing back and forth between 2 Timothy and Mark chapter 13. So just kind of, you know, hold your Bible and go back and forth with me. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to be in verse number 1, and we're going to read down through verse number 2. Take a look at it. This is Paul's last words to Timothy. In fact, Paul had a lot to say about the end times. You can read about it there in 2 Timothy. You can read about it in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. He had a lot to say in those two books. In fact, you can read what Peter had to say about what Paul had to say in 2 Peter chapter number 3, where they're talking about the end times as well. A lot, lot of the Bible is preparing us for what's going to come, for what's going to happen. And it says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1. It says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Notice the kingdom of God will come and God will judge the living and the dead. All of us, our works are going to go before the Lord and God, the righteous judge, will determine good or evil. Whether we're his or whether we're not, he'll either say, enter into the joy of the Lord or away from me, I never knew you. So he says, I charge you therefore to do what? Verse number two, if you can read, read these first three words with me. One, two, three, preach the word. Notice we're not preaching ourselves. We're not preaching philosophies. We're not preaching the latest ideologies. We're not preaching what we heard someone else preach on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. No, we're not preaching uh, new age mentalities. We're not preaching what Oprah or Dr. Phil had to say. We are preaching one thing. That is the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that is the book 
look for me. It's the only thing that has the power to change. It is the seed that has the power to produce after its own kind. It's the only thing that's going to work. It's the only thing that can save a soul. It's the only thing that can heal a body. It's the only thing that can clear a mind. We are to preach the word. He goes on and he says, be ready in season and out of season. Listen, if the end time's hit and it gets bad and there are troubled times, you need to be ready to preach. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Go ahead and preach, pastor. That's your job. That's what I pay you to do. No, you give your tithes and your offerings to fund the gospel in the house of God. But listen, I'm here to build you up to do the work of the ministry. You are the full-time minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you didn't know this, you are called to preach. What does that mean, to proclaim the good news? It doesn't mean you have to be eloquent and have a three-point message. Hey, my dear coworker, I want you to hear these three points in a poem that I have for you today about why you should give your life in, to Jesus. It, 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 it's not it. All you have to do is proclaim and start with your testimony. Hey, I was a screw-up. I was messed up. I was tore up from the floor up, but Jesus got me. He picked me up. He dusted me off. He set my feet upon the rock. He cleaned me up. He got me off drugs. He got me out of those bad relationships. He put my head on straight. He gave me a purpose. He gave me a future. He gave me a hope. He saved me, and if he saved this old sinner and made me a saint, guess what he can do in your life? It's that simple. It's that simple just telling somebody, Jesus loves you. He died for you. My goodness, he wants to be with you. And if you'll pray to him and give him your heart and life, he'll save you. Just cry out to him. It's so simple. It can take just a few moments of loving someone enough to open your mouth and to proclaim the good news. And so the Bible says to be ready to preach the word. If the end times are coming, it's not the time to shut up and let up and quit. And they might beat you up. They might threaten you. But you keep preaching no matter what comes on the earth. We need to preach to the end. Second thing is this. Mark chapter 13, turn back there with me. Mark chapter 13, we're gonna read in verse number 12 and verse number 13 this time. Look at what it says, Mark chapter 13, verse number 12. It says, now brother will betray brother to death and a father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Now, once again, we see this being fulfilled all throughout history and in our day and age today. Uh, maybe you didn't know this, but there are nations where it is illegal to preach the gospel. There are nations where it is illegal to convert someone. It may be legal to be a Christian, but if you try and convert someone else, you can be thrown in jail for that. And oftentimes, it is family members who are putting their own family members in jail, beating them up or accusing them before the government. It's a very sad thing because they're the closest ones to the other people. And when they get saved and then they start to share their faith, somebody gets angry about it and they share it with the government officials and they come in and they lock them up or they beat them up or they're tortured, or different things take place. In fact, in Muslim nations, they have something called honor killings. That is, when somebody is converted, they believe it's honorable for them to murder that person. And they believe that they will have a greater reward in eternity because of that. And so you find fathers killing their daughters. I cannot imagine doing that. I cannot imagine the horrific things. And yet... They have these things, even in our land, it's uh, oftentimes covered up and they won't uh, spread it around, but it still happens. It's amazing how the words of Jesus are just unfolding right in front of us. But look at verse number 13, it says this, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, not just your family members. You won't just be betrayed by the people closest to you, but everywhere you turn, he says, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. Look at this last sentence, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. So not only were we to preach to the end, but Jesus just made this mention. He said we must endure to the end. Keep going. Doesn't matter who turns their back on you. Doesn't matter if all those closest to you kiss, kick you out and cast you out. Doesn't matter if no one likes you and everybody hates you. He says to just keep going. Now, I don't know if Jesus is gonna come back in our day. It, it could happen, definitely it could happen. It, it could happen today. Now, I don't think that it will because there are still some things that I see in the Word of God that, that need to happen, like the lawless one being revealed and, you know, the, the, the abomination that causes desecration in the temple. Well, that means there needs to be a temple. So I'm looking to see if in Israel they're going to build a third temple. They may very well. 
And in fact, there are people right now at Temple Society that, that's putting together plans and they've got uh, things laid out. They're looking for the foundations to find out where the temple would have been so that they can put it right on that same place. There's currently a dome of the rock right there that I believe that they're going to need to probably move. That's going to be quite a, a battle and quite a war that's going to take place. It's very interesting to see what happens. See, keep your eyes on Israel because they're the time clock of the end times. The fact that they're even here is a fulfillment of prophecy some 75 years ago that, that all of a sudden uh, the people who were scattered and who were gone on the face of the earth resurrected a nation in a dead language in a day. And the prophet said, can a nation be born in a day? And certainly they were. And even though they were trying to be wiped out, they were trying to push them. Nations came against them, tried to wipe them out. And in six days, the, the nation of Israel was still standing. It's amazing, amazing, amazing history. And we're living in these wonderful, fascinating times. And so we can see that there's some things that need to take place. But listen, if God doesn't come back in our day and age, we need to continue to endure. What does that look like for us? What does that look like? Because, we, you know, it'd be one thing if it was just, hey, we're going we're gonna to bear down. We're going to go through these end times. We're going to make it through. But what if Jesus doesn't come back in our day? What, is he, what if he doesn't come back in our children's day? What if he doesn't come back in our children's children's day? And so on and so on. And so on. Well, there was a minister named Fred Craddock who said, To give my life for Christ appears glorious. To pour myself out for others and pay the ultimate price of martyrdom, I'll do it, Lord. I'm ready to go out in a blaze of glory. We think giving our all to the Lord is like taking a thousand dollar bill and laying it on the table. Here's my life, Lord. I'm giving it all. But the reality for most of us is that He sends us to the bank and has us cash in the thousand dollars for quarters. We go through life putting out 25 cents here, 50 cents there, 25 cents here, 25 cents there. We listen to the neighbor's kid's trouble instead of saying, get lost, kid. We serve our family members when they've been unkind to us. We give a cup of water to a shaky old man in a nursing home. We serve at the food distribution center or somewhere in the church. We're kind to our coworkers and the people in our community. Usually giving our life to Christ isn't glorious. Is done in all those little acts of love, 25 cents at a time. It would be easy to go out in a flash of glory. It's harder to live the Christian life a little by little over the long haul. We are to endure to the end. See, if we're going to be prepared for the end times, we don't need to just prepare for the hard times and the troubled times. We need to be prepared for the long haul. We need to prepare our children for the long haul. We need to continue to plug away and endure, to hang tight and hold on to what God has for us. But if the end times should come, 2 Timothy chapter 3, once again, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 1 says this, but know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. That it's going to be perilous. There's going to be trouble that comes on the earth. And he goes on to list things. And as you read the list, I would encourage you to read on in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It looks like where we live today. People are going to be fornicators, adulterers, drunkards. They're going to be disobedient to their parents. I mean, things that we see all around us. There's going to be outbursts of wrath and, and judgments and all this kind of stuff. They're not going to put up with sound doctrine. It's all happening in our day and age. We are living in these last days. And so we need to endure and continue on. And continue to move forward. Now, Jesus goes on to speak of a great suffering and of a great tribulation. Now, once again, prophetically, the present application would have been for the Jews and the Christians in Jerusalem who would have seen the Roman armies coming in 66 AD. They would have been standing in the place that they should not have been. And because they saw that, they fled. Now, not everyone fled. Millions of Jews were slaughtered there in Jerusalem as they breached the walls and as they came in. And eventually the Jewish people all went into the temple, and there in the temple it said that a drunken Roman soldier let a flaming arrow fly, and it burnt the temple with all of the people on the inside, and all the people were cremated on the inside of the temple. The gold of the temple melted in between the cracks of the, of the stones, and because they wanted the gold, they tore down the temple stone by stone, and they threw it down off of the temple mound, and there they would get a hold of the gold, and then they would go on to the next stone, and then they'd go on to the next stone. And thus, Jesus' words were fulfilled in 70 AD, where the whole temple was raised, all of the buildings were torn down, and the people were all slaughtered. It was perilous times for them. Jesus warned that if there was one person in the field, another one would be taken. One on the rooftop and another would be gone. And he said, 
don't go down into your house, don't get anything, run for the hills. And he said, pray that your flight doesn't happen on a Sabbath or in the winter. And he said, it's gonna be really bad for the nursing mothers and the pregnant. And, and it was just an amazing thought. Now again, that would be a present application for the people some 40 years later after Jesus spoke these words there in Jerusalem. But we also understand that there's gonna be perilous times in the end times when, when the generation that's here on the earth goes through those times that it's going to be very similar and things are gonna happen that are the same. It's gonna be troublesome, but Jesus' language starts to change when he talks about a future tribulation which would come upon the world in the end times. Let's look at it in Mark chapter 13 once again. This time verse number 24. And we're going to read down through verse number 27. Mark 13 verse 24 starting out says this. But in those days after that tribulation. Notice after that tribulation. So this is something that's taking place later on. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of the heaven will fall, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Now, he starts to talk about celestial beings like the sun and the moon and the stars, and we identify those things. And we can see those things shaking, but I don't think that it's necessarily a literal sense in the terms that it's talking about, because in the book of Revelation, it talks about the sun and the moon and the stars as well, that they don't give their light. Uh, in fact, it talks about them turning to blood, right? And, and then also it talks about stars falling to the earth. Now, if one star fell to the earth, we would be completely consumed, because the earth is not bigger than the sun. In fact, our sun is a small star in our galaxy, and, and it can hold and contain many hundreds of the earth inside of it if you were to pile them all up on the inside. And we know that it's burning hot gases that if we were to be uh, just inches closer to the sun, I mean, if you push the earth, you know, a couple feet over, we would burn up. And so if you put the, the sun on the earth, we, we know that that wouldn't happen. So it can't be in a literal sense. It has to be speaking in spiritual figurative language. Is that right? Now, I want you to notice that in the verse 25 at the end, it says, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. The powers in the heavens. You know, in Ephesians chapter 6, it talked about our spiritual fight, and it says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Powers and principalities and rulers of darkness of this present age. And so we can see that spiritually, when the return of the Lord happens and the kingdom of God is set up on the earth, that the powers in the heavens, sun and moon and stars, right, which all represent beings and angelic hosts and that sort of a thing, that there's going to be a shake and there's going to be a shifting and a turning. Things are going to change in that moment. Verse number 26, then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Verse 27, and then he will send his angels to gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest parts of the earth to the farthest parts of heaven. Verse 32, drop down there with me, but of that day and hour no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Right there you know how to get away from error concerning the end times. If somebody comes to you and says, I know when Jesus is coming back, I've studied the ancient Hebrew manuscripts, I've studied all the numbers, and I, I've got secret knowledge that no one else has. Jesus is coming back on October 2nd, 2032. Guaranteed, give me your money. Don't, 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 don't. Why? Because no one knows the day. Not even Jesus. Here's Jesus incarnate, right? This is the Son of God. This is God in the flesh, and yet Jesus submitted himself so much so to the human experience that the omnipresent God is now present only in one place, in one form on the earth. So even though he's God, he's limited himself to the human experience. In the same way, he limited even his mind and his knowledge that this omniscient God, this all-knowing God, would limit his understanding of even the day that he was going to return. And he said, that knowledge is reserved for the Father alone. So that means if someone tells you, I know when Jesus is coming back, no, you don't. Because no man knows the day or the hour. Now, we do know the times and the seasons, right? We can say, hey, ooh, it's happening. In fact, Jesus even gave the illustration of the fig tree once again. He says, look to the fig tree. When you see the leaves that are there, you know that summer's coming, okay? So we can look around and we can say, hey, the end is near. We, we understand we're nearing the end times because of all the things that we're seeing around us. We can identify the times and the seasons, but the day and the hour, I don't know. You don't know. And none of those other fools that think that they know, know. Is anybody listening today? Come on, somebody. Verse 33. He says, take heed. Watch and pray. Everybody say, watch and pray. For you do not know when the time is. Verse 34, it's like a man going to a far country 
who left his house and gave authority to his servants, each to his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Everybody say, watch. Verse 37, drop down, and what I say to you, I say to all. What's that last word? Now, if we're going to be prepared for the end times, we are to preach to the end. We are to endure to the end. Can anybody help me out and tell me what the last way that we need to be prepared for the end times is? We need to what? Watch to the end. Watch to the end. We need to be prepared. We should not mistake bad times for the end times and give up when Jesus doesn't return when we think he should. We need to continue to be watching, always waiting, always expectant, always ready, always holy. Why? Because Jesus is coming back, and I'm watching, and I'm waiting at the door to give entrance to the master for when he comes. 2 Timothy chapter 4 this time. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse number 5 says this, But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard tells a parable of a theater where a variety show was happening. Each show was more fantastic than the last one and is applauded by the audience in greater measure every time. Suddenly, the manager comes forward and apologizes for the interruption, but the theater is on fire. He begs his patrons to leave in an orderly fashion. The audience thinks this is the most amusing turn of the evening, and they cheer thunderously. The manager again implores them to leave the burning building, and he is again applauded vigorously. At last, he can do no more. The fire raced the whole building, and the fun-loving audience with it. And so, concluded Kierkegaard, Will our age, I sometimes think, go down in fiery destruction to the applause of a crowded house of cheering spectators? Luke's gospel warns us in the same story when he tells the same account of Jesus talking about the end times of three things that can distract us. Three things. Self-indulgence, drunkenness, and worldly cares. Self-indulgence, drunkenness, and worldly cares. I remember there was a time where I actually prayed this to the Lord. I was saved at a young age, and as I was growing up, I was studying the end times and that sort of thing, and it caused such fear in me that I actually asked God, I said, God, could you please not come back in my day? It just confessions of a pastor. Here we go, right? Why? Because I was being selfish. God, I don't want to go through that. God, I want to see my children grow up. I, I want to see my daughter. I want to walk her down the aisle. I want to hold my grandkids, God. And, and God, to be honest, I don't like pain, and I don't like tribulation, and I don't like all this stuff that I see. And so, God, can I not go through that? God, could you please just wait? And that was a very self-indulgent prayer. It was a very selfish prayer. And, and in a society where we're constantly navel-gazing, looking at ourselves, just kind of like, wow, look at me. You know what I mean? Everybody's all about themselves, and, and they won't do things unless it is good for them, right? They won't even accept a job unless they're like, hey, what, what, what do you got for me? You know what I mean? Like, what, what kind of bennies? What kind of this and that? Now, now, don't get me wrong. You need to provide for your family. You need to make sure that they're going to take care of you and not abuse you and use you and that sort of a thing. But I've heard of people that it's just like, seriously? Like, you got to have a bonus and a car and this and that. And, and, and you know, if, if they don't like it, then you're just going to go back and live in your mom's basement again. You know, I mean, it's like, come on. What's going on? It's just wild, and yet our society is so me-oriented and me-centered that this unholy trinity of me, myself, and I have governed people's actions and responsibilities to where they have, have, have given up on being other-centered and living the Christian life where God first, other second, and me third. It's just an amazing thing. And so he says that that is going to get us off of being prepared and watching for Jesus' return. Second thing is drunkenness. Now, of course, that speaks to the excess of alcohol, which God clearly speaks against in the Word of God, but also it speaks to being drunk on other things, drunk on a lifestyle, drunk on the perversions, drunk on, uh, you know, different experiences and things like that. People literally get intoxicated with philosophies and ideas and things that are going on, whatever the latest and greatest is, and what, whatever the fad is, what this trend, what are people doing out there, and, and they become intoxicated and they get drunk on these things. In fact, in the book of Revelation, it talks about getting drunk on the fornications of Babylon. It's an amazing thought when you think about all the implications of what that means, but it's worldliness. It's getting lost in those things and getting inebriated where you cannot think straight because now all of a sudden you're intoxicated with these other things. And the Bible warns us clearly that that's going to stop us from watching. And the last one is cares, weights, pressures, 
Just like we talked about thinking about the end times. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? It's going to be so bad. I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if you can make it. I don't know if we can make it. And people get off on these cares. They get weighed down with making money, weighed down with having to have the nicest car or the nicest house or the best experience on Instagram. And then, man, they post it. I better post. And what if, what if people don't like me and all this? And we get weighed down with these cares, weighed down with these pressures and we're worried about what everyone else is doing what everyone else is thinking how we're going to make it what's going to happen rather than trusting in the living god for every moment of every day and watching for the return of our lord jesus christ these distractions are designed to get us off our watch and onto ourselves and if the master is coming we don't want to be caught off guard we want to be prepared for his coming how can we be prepared for the end times well preach to the end Endure to the end and watch to the end. Jesus made these statements for us to know what to do and how to do it. Did you guys get something from the word of the Lord today? Now don't leave because there's some special stuff going to happen in a moment. Some very special stuff going to happen in a moment. So I want to encourage you guys to remain seated. But if this interests you, if this excites you, I would encourage you the next time Bible college is open. And Pastor Teresa, is it, is it for the winter? Are you going to open it up? Okay, so in the winter about January, uh, when, at girls' night out, that sort of a thing, and Christmas time, as we head into January, there's going to be a Bible college sign so I would encourage you to sign up for the Bible college because we have an eschatology course. And, and listen, can, can I tell you something? If you have questions... Please don't ask me because I don't know, all right? I, this is not my subject. This is not my area of expertise. Ask Dr. Kobernick, okay? He teaches eschatology here at The Rock and, uh, and get into that Bible college course and find out more about it. Also, there's some great resources out there. I want to encourage you. The New Spirit-Filled Life Bible, uh, Pastor Jack Hayford, who's gone on to be with the Lord, very scholarly. He put all of the notes in there and um, throughout Revelation in the book of Daniel, even Matthew chapter 24, there's some great notes, some great uh, uh, context and different things about the end times, even in the back of the, the Bible, there's some study notes there for you. And then um, a guy by the name of Rick Renner, who's a missionary in uh, Moscow, Russia, wrote a book. It's about this thick, but it's big print, all right? And it's called The End Time Survival Guide. He just came out with that. That's a great resource that Pastor Jessica just got a hold of on Amazon. And uh, so I would encourage you to get a hold of those resources. Great resources out there. Uh, there's also some terrible resources out there. So be careful, be wary, and, and just stick with what Jesus said, okay? Now, I want to introduce a friend of mine to you because, like I said, we have something very special going to take place, and this is the most important part of the meeting for many of you guys in this place. And I wanted to prepare your heart because we've been talking about the end times. And years ago, I, I heard this, and I wanted to present it again to you guys, but my friend, and he's a, uh, my goodness, how do I even introduce you, my brother? He's an OG in, in gospel rap and, and gospel hip-hop. He's one of the pioneers that started it all uh, back when nobody was doing it. He got persecuted for his faith. He got told he was preaching the devil's gospel and that he was doing devil music by doing Christian rap and was kicked out of churches and was persecuted for his master's sake. It's an honor. It's a privilege, my brother. And uh, I want to introduce to you T-Bone here, and he's going to come up and share some things with us. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Somebody give God some praise in this place tonight. Come on. It's an honor to be here today, man. I haven't touched a microphone in over four years. I retired from music about four years ago, but Pastor Dan called me this morning and he said, hey T, he said, could you do a song for us that I heard years ago about the rapture? And when your pastor calls you, I just simply text back, let's go fishing, amen? So I just wanna, I wanna share this song. This is a song that I wrote literally over 30 years ago. It was released in 1993. Many of you probably weren't even born. And um, it's a song that talks about the rapture. Like he said, you know, no man knows a day nor the hour. The Bible says that when he comes back, he's coming back like a thief in the night, right? So I wrote a song called Thief in the Night, and I pray that it blesses you guys. If I mess up with the lyrics, it's been a long time. Pastor Antonio told me he knows all the words, so he can help me out. But I want you guys to pay attention to the words, and it goes like this. Not good enough is a thought that's dwelling through my mind. I thought that I could see, but I was really spiritually blind. Going to church on Sunday, then Monday, smoking on a spliff and still be thinking I could uplift the name of Christ with my hands waved up in the air. Living a double life and thinking the Lord was in one accord with all the things that I chose to do. But serving two gods told me be like being a blood, but you be sporting blue. You say it ain't true? Yo, don't take it from me. Read it yourself. Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23. It happened to me a 
pastor's kid never did a bid thinking I could live a lukewarm life and carry a knife in my left hand and in my right carry a bible shout revival then shank it twice for my survival but little did I know that it would all come to an end when I was walking home from school on a Friday with an unsafe friend I saw my dad's car wrecked down the street so I ran to see if he was alive but no one was inside I couldn't believe my eyes what was going on so I ran to the house to see if I could get the info from my mom the door was wide open so I ran frantically down the hall shouting and screaming but no one seemed to hear my call was I dreaming or could it really be the rapture happened and the Lord took everyone except for me I dropped to my knees and prayed but I couldn't feel his spirit the way I could before when he was knocking at my heart's door so here I am alone in a world that's straight up dark and if I want to buy some clothes to eat they say that I gotta take the mark now it's my choice taking a stop I quickly made my pick I choose to rob and steal because I'll never take the 666 I jump in a stolen car get on the freeway heading east because they'll cut off my head if I don't take the mark of the beast it's three months later in an abandoned building I live constantly ducking and dodging because now I'm known as a fugitive I'm frustrated mentally aggravated but I gotta last because I know Jesus ain't coming back for a second pass I blast just to stay alive I'm going insane because like iced tea to me it's all about surviving the game if I would have only searched for him from the start when I had a chance I wouldn't be here suffering for all the things that I did in the past but I thought the life I lived in God's eyes was enough to go to church on Sunday and keep my Bible from collecting dust. What's going on? I'm surrounded. I guess they found my hiding place because all I see is Uzi's glocks and nines pointed at my face. They said, renounce your God or die. So I replied, the Lord is my savior. As the tears ran down my eyes, my time has finally come. I guess I'm right to go to my father's paradise, a place that sinners will never know. They whacked me up the platform. It's execution time. Now on the heavenly stage is the only place place I'll rhyme they lay me down it's only seconds till I'm gone and dead please God have mercy somebody catch my head come on thank you my brother and I think you got every word Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad? Can we just say thank you to T-Bone? There's a sobering reality in what he just said, and I hope that you caught it. There are too many people that are living a double life. Many people come into church thinking that they're right with God because they carry a Bible, because they say amen. Maybe they attended a revival meeting, prayed a prayer at one time, and yet, none of that makes you a Christian. And if the Lord comes in our day, I believe that there are going to be a lot of people who think that they're Christians, that recognize and realize that they missed the mark. And they're going to wish that they had listened during the altar calls. They're going to wish that they didn't get up and walk out. And yeah, I'm talking to those that are outside right now. You can hear me all the way through the breezeways, all the way out to the parking lot. Stop and listen because God wants to speak to your life right now. Are you saved? Are you really a Christian? If you were to die, if today was your last day, would you make it to heaven or would you end up in hell? See, just by coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. We think that we just show up to church, call ourselves a Christian, that makes us a Christian when nothing could be further from the truth. It doesn't work like that. Any more than you can go to your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. You'll never house people in your body and drive down the, earth, drive down the, the freeway at 65 miles an hour. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people think, well, wait a second. I was raised in church. My parents told me you were Christians. That's not going to make it. I don't care if they hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or Christmas as a child, took you to religious classes, Sunday school, Sabbath school, catechism class. Sometimes people think because they're not some other religion that by default they get lumped into the category of being a Christian. No way. It doesn't work like that. God's not looking at your life, scratching his head, going, I wonder what they are. I guess they're Christians. It's not going to make it. You need to listen up because God wants to speak to your life right now. I'm going to ask once again, no one get up, no one leave during this time. Don't let anything distract you. God's talking to your life. Your eternal life is at stake right now. Some of you in this place, you think that because you memorized a scripture, got involved in a church service, helped out, sang in a choir, carried a pastor's Bible, made decisions in a church because people thought of you as a leader, that's going to get you into heaven. Maybe you got a membership card to a church and thought that that's going to get you into heaven. God's not looking for a membership card or your church involvement. He's not looking for how many volunteer hours you gave at a church. It doesn't work. 
You'd be a pastor, I'm a good person. I've done a lot of good deeds. I know God wants us to be good, and I think I've been good enough. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I've given money to charities, been nice to my neighbors. I'm better than that guy. But you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say God's lining you up with the next guy, seeing if you're better than them, and whoever's good goes to heaven, whoever's bad goes to hell. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's not interested in your good works to get you saved because we're all sinners in need of a Savior. Sometimes people think, but pastor, I know God. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I celebrate Christmas and Easter, sing the songs every year of my life. I've got scriptures memorized, Old and New Testament. I could quote them to you, pastor. Yeah, and so could the devil. You'll find that in the Gospels. Devil quoting scriptures. The demons believe, the Bible says, and they tremble. They're not going to make it. They know that they're going to end up in eternity and punishment and hellfire. That's why they tremble at the end of that. Today, I want to make sure that's not you. Hell was never designed for you or for me. It was made for the devil and the angels that rebelled. And yet we can choose with our life where we end up, whether heaven or whether hell. We can't get to heaven your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee's way. Not all roads lead to heaven, contrary to what popular culture would have us to believe. There's only one way to heaven, and that's God's way. Jesus said it in John, the third chapter, that you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no other way you're going to make it except that you be born again. Now, I know society, Hollywood movies, television books, and blogs on the internet have made a mockery out of that. They've raked it to the coals, made it out to be something that it's not. Well, let's not let them define for us what being born again is. Let's let the Bible do that for us, shall we? What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, being born again has always meant the same thing. It means simply this, that you've surrendered to God all of your heart, and you've surrendered to God all of your life. Just like you just heard from our brother T-Bone. He said he wished he would have made that decision beforehand and didn't get left behind. The Bible says to seek God while he may be found. You don't have an eternal future waiting for you to make this decision. No man knows the day or the hour. It could be today. Come, Lord Jesus, I hope he does. But for those of you who are unprepared, I hope for your sake, he waits. And you've got this time and this moment, this opportunity waiting for you. You know, we're all one accident, one incident, one virus, one earthquake, one breath away from eternity. People die every day of all kinds of reasons. You could go to your car, start your car, and your heart stop just like that, and you're gone. Don't wait another moment to think about your eternity. You've got this time and this moment guaranteed to you. And what if today was your last day? Would you end up in heaven or would you end up in hell? You need to give God all of your heart and all of your life because that's what being born again really means. It's a surrender. It's a willful surrender where you say yes to Jesus. God, I'm giving you all of my heart and all of my life, and you receive all of his heart, and you receive all of his life. And God says yes to you. He receives you as his own, makes you brand new, and now you can be with him for eternity. You say, Pastor, I've been such a screw up. Let me clean up my act and then I'll come to God. No, you come to God and he cleans you up from the inside out. Well, what if I mess up after I get saved? Well, then, hey, you get up and you keep going with God. Remember, he who endures to the end will be saved. You consistently show up and keep following Jesus. That's called repentance where you turn from your way and you follow God's way. We all stumble in many things. No one is perfect, but we are all continuing to endure and follow Jesus and being perfected. We're, we're all growing, getting better each and every day. That's what this thing is all about. It's God working with your life. See, Pastor, I prayed a prayer at one time. Isn't that enough? Well, no, because did you follow up that prayer with all of your heart and all of your life? If not, God sees through those things. And he knows where you're really at. You can't just throw up a prayer, live like the devil, and expect to go to heaven. No, you've got to give God everything, all of your heart and all of your life. Because God's listening to the words of your mouth, then he's watching your life to see if it follows. You see, Pastor, I'll make a deathbed confession. Well, don't wait. You don't know when that'll be. We're all one accident, one incident, one virus, one breath away from eternity, like we've already stated. You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. In a moment, I'm going to give you this opportunity by counting to three. One, two, three. When I say three, I'm going to pop my hand on this microphone. Bang, just like that. When you hear the sound of my hand pop on that microphone, bang, that's your opportunity to simply raise your hand. What you're doing in raising your hand is you're making the statement saying, I want to give God all my heart, I want to give God all my life, I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up, I'll count it, you can put it right back down. You might be thinking, wait a second, wait a second, hold on, time out, pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. But think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. A moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. And yet the devil thinks you're a fool, so he's trying to talk you out of this right now. Tell that devil to go 
jump in a fiery lake, you're not going with them. You're going on with God today. Get ready to get your hands up. Listen, if you landed in hell, you'd raise both arms, both legs, your underwear on a flagpole, if you could. Or just like you heard from that song a moment ago, you don't want to go through the things that have come upon the earth. You are not appointed to wrath if you're a Christian. But if you're not a Christian, there's only fearful expectation of judgment. Don't let that be you. Today, get ready to get your hand up. The Bible says it's appointed for man once to die and then to the judgment. You're not coming back as a dog or a frog working your way up into a human, getting another shot at this. You've got one life to live, this life. And eternity's long, like we talked about. There is an end coming, but then there is an eternity future. And we can be with God or we can be in hell. It's your call today. It's your choice today. Make the right choice. Push past that embarrassment and give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise your hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Make sure today. Who should raise your hand if you've never done this before, never given God all of your heart and all of your life? Could have been in church all your life, but you never crossed that line. Today is your day of salvation. Or finally, who should raise your hand? Maybe you're lukewarm or you backslid in this place. Jesus said, when I come, I want to find you hot or cold because if I find you lukewarm, he says, I'll vomit you from my mouth. You know what Jesus is really saying? He's saying, in or out. You can't do both. You either is or you ain't. Come on. But don't play the fence. Don't, don't be out there in the world and in the church and expect to impress God because you come to church on Sunday with your Bible saying amen and hallelujah. God sees past those things. You need to surrender to God all of your heart. You need to surrender to God all of your life. If that's you in any of those categories I just listed, you know you need to get right with God, both live and online. Get it ready to get your hands up on the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. There's one. Thank you. There's two, three. Thank you. God bless you guys. There's three. There's four, five, six. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven up top. Got you guys up there. Thank you. Eleven wise people. Who else today? Twelve up there. Thank you. Got you right there. Thirteen right there. Yes. Thank you. Fourteen right here. Yes. God bless you. Fifteen, sixteen right there. Thank you. Thank you. Up top. Seventeen, eighteen. Got you guys right there. Eighteen wise people. Who else today? Who else? Nineteen, twenty right here. Yes. Thank you guys. I got you. 20 wise people. Best decision of your entire life. Why? Because it impacts your eternity. Anybody else? There's 20 wise people already. Who else today? You need to give God. Yeah, 21. Yes, wonderful. Wonderful. That's great. 21 wise people. Anyone else that I did not already see? If I saw you, you can put your hand down. But if I didn't see you, get that hand up real high. Anybody else? There's 22. You're pointing over here. Anybody else real quick that I did not already see? Anyone else? In the family rooms, did I miss any of you guys? Give me a big wave. It's kind of hard to see if I didn't see you. Anybody else on, the, on this side that you're giving your heart and life to the Lord? All right. It's about 21 wise people. Can we give the Lord a great big praise for that today? <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to ask once again, no one leave during this time. Let's respect what the Holy Spirit is doing in the lives of people. Would you stand to your feet? And for those of you that raised your hand, all 21 of you, or number 22, number 23, number 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend of your friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. Come on down right now. Come on down to the front. Come on down to the front. Come on there. Come on. Let's give him a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on down. The precious blood of Jesus Christ who come to Come on, if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, get out of your seat, get in the aisle, and meet me up front right now. Come on down. Come on, come on, come on. They're still coming. They're still coming. Let's keep it going for them, church. Let's keep it going for them. Come on, you need to come. Just get out of your seat. Get in the aisle and meet us up front right now. Come on down. They're still coming. Come on, there's more of you. You need to come out in the alley. Meet us up front right now. Come on down. Come on down. Take that first step. The rest will get easier. Come on. Come on, they're still coming.
They're still coming. Church, nudge your neighbor. Say, come on, friend. If you need to go, I'll go with you. And then bring them. Bring them right now. Come on. Nudge your neighbor. Nudge your neighbor. Come on, bring them. Well, thank God you guys have come. This is the best decision of your entire life right here, right now. Came to give God all of your heart. Came to give God all of your life. Going to be born again. Brand new on the inside. That's an amazing thing. That old sinner that you know of going to be gone. You get a brand new start with a brand new heart. God's going to clean you up from the inside out. I want to encourage you guys to stay committed and stay consistent in that commitment. What does that mean? It means that you got to show up every day. We talked about endurance, right? Giving out the 25 cents moment by moment. It's coming to church. It's reading your Bible. It's praying. It's being faithful to God, doing the things that God has called you to do, growing and learning. If you mess up, you get up, you keep going. I want to encourage you guys to come back to church not just next week, but this week. My goodness, we got church service tonight at 6. Come on back. Okay, Wednesday night at 7. We've got uh, different services all throughout the week, eight, eight of them. Eight options for you guys. We're here working hard for you. Get two of those a week if you can. Get, I mean, if you want to, you can hang out. Come get four of them with us, right? Lots of opportunities to come and grow in the things of God. And as you do, I guarantee you next August, at the end of the month, next year, you'll look at your life and say, wow, look at what God has done in my life. With those thoughts in mind, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in heart. going to be born again, okay? Brand new on the inside. And everybody's going to join in together with you in this prayer. So you'll hear all of the people around you praying with you, okay? Just make sure to focus on the words that you're praying and just pray them to God. Even online, if you're giving your heart to the Lord, you can pray this prayer out loud together with us as well. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes and say these words out loud together in faith. Say, Father God, I come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus. I give you all of my heart and all of my life. Please come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of my past. And give me a future with you. For I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, that he came and died and was raised again to life just for me. Thank you, Jesus. Let it be known that from this day on, I am saved. I'm born again. I'm a Christian. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Fill me with your spirit and lead me and teach me your ways so I can follow you for the rest of my days on earth into eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey guys, welcome to the family of God. We're so excited for your new life in Jesus Christ. Now listen, you didn't just join a church, but you did join the family of God. But this church wants to encourage you. We want to help you. I didn't grow in the things of God and become who I am without people around me, encouraging me and helping me and teaching me some things and, you know, just sitting and praying with me, answering questions and things like that. So we want to give you that same opportunity. My friend, Pastor Joel, over here waving at you, really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance. He's going to just encourage you, give you some free stuff, okay? We got some little booklets for the kids as well, if they'd like that. And then he's going to introduce you to some great people we have here called spiritual personal trainers, friends, who will come alongside you and encourage you, want to meet with you before church when you come back, okay? He'll describe how that works. It's easy, it's free, and you need to do it, okay? Then third, you ready for this one? He's going to let you go after a couple minutes, okay? So if you guys just make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way, let's give him a hand. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise today. Hallelujah. Come on, aren't you glad you came to church today? Isn't God good? Amen. I just want to thank T-Bone once again. Thank you for sharing your gift with us, my brother. We love you and appreciate you. God bless you, my friend. God is so good. We're just grateful to be in ministry together. It's good to win souls with you, my brother. Thanks for helping me cast the net today. It's awesome to see the, the harvest that God brings in here at The Rock. And we're humbled and grateful to be a part of what God is doing. I wonder, does anybody know how to be prepared for the end times? Oh, you, guys, you guys jumbled all three of them. All, the first service, they, they, they started with the last one. So why don't we start with the first one? What was the first one? Preach to the end. What was the second one? 
Endure to the end. All right, I'll help some of you out, okay? And then thirdly, what? Yeah, you guys got the third one. All right, all right, good. One out of three ain't bad. Praise the Lord. God is so good. Love you guys so much. Tonight at 6 o'clock, I want to invite you guys back. Different music, different message. It's going to be wonderful. For those of you that joined us online, you prayed that prayer. Hang with us after we dismiss, and there will be some instructions for you well to get a hold of those same materials and those same connections. Can I bless you as you go? Would you lift your hands, Lord? Let me bless you. Father, I bless the saints of God from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. They are blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming, blessed going. May everything they put their hands to, they shall prosper. And Lord, with a great big shout of faith about our area, we declare that the Inland Empire shall be saved. Hey, thank you so much for joining us online. If you just gave your heart to Jesus and pray that salvation prayer with our pastor, congratulations and welcome to the family of God. Here at The Rock, we want to get you plugged in and set up for success as you start this new walk with God. In a moment, I'd like for you to head over to our Respond to God page by clicking the link provided in the comments where you can fill out your information so we can provide you with some free materials. We have a booklet called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. We'd love to mail you this paper copy if you are within the continental United States. If not, don't worry about it. We have an electronic copy in PDF format that we would be happy to email you. We also have a comic book we'd love to send out for any kids that have made a decision to follow Jesus. It helps explain their new walk with Jesus in a fun and age-friendly way. We not only want to provide you with these free materials, but if you live locally, we would also like to get you connected with a friend, a spiritual personal trainer, or as we like to call them, SPTs, who can help guide you through your new relationship with God. We encourage you to connect with the local church in your area. And if you are in the Inland Empire, remember you're always welcome here at The Rock Church. Well, it was great hearing the word of God with you guys today. We can't wait to see you at our next service. And remember, God loves you and so do we.